beautiful day in this neighborhood, a beautiful day for a neighbor. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? It's a neighborly day in this beauty wood, a neighborly day for a beauty. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? I have always wanted to have a neighbor just like you. I've always wanted to live in a neighborhood with you. So let's make the most of this beautiful day. Since we're together, we might as well say, Would you be mine? Could you be mine? Won't you be my neighbor? Won't you please? Won't you please? Please, won't you be my neighbor? My neighbor. Glad we're together again. Hi, neighbor. <laughs> I'm Robert Kelly. I'm your neighbor and one of the pastors here at the church. And uh, we uh, certainly do love the idea of our suburban neighborhoods. We actually live, my wife and I, my kids, we live in Carl Place, which is an early Levitt community. It was, it was done before Levitt Town as one of the test uh, areas to see if this construction techniques would kind of work in a larger setting. And uh, some of their decisions they made were so good. You know, they tucked the power lines behind the homes. You know, they kind of hid all the, the ugly stuff. And so the open streets. And then they, they planted sycamore, which, of course, at the time were small. But the sycamore grew uh, into these massive trees. And they have these huge arching branches that cover the, the street. And you can you have these, like, tree-lined streets throughout our, our neighborhood. He's just made so many good decisions sort of creating it. And no fences allowed in the front yard, which is really cool because... You know, you have this sort of open feel to, to everything. And, uh, you know, we moved into the house. We had these visions of sort of, you know, neighborly chats. You know, people walking through their neighborhoods and talking to each other and becoming friendly. Uh, block parties and all of these Mr. Roger-esque moments. Uh, and very uh, warming of the heart. You know, we love suburbia and those neighborhoods because we yearn for community. See, I think there's a reason that these things stir our hearts. I think somewhere deep inside, we long for fellowship, for real community, or what the Bible calls koinonia. We want the neighborly community. We want friends because we need friends. It's how we were designed. And though we love the idea and the experience of koinonia, whenever we taste it, it seems that so many of our decisions work against true community. I'm not even sure we see it happening. But in effect, we sabotage the very thing that we desire. So I need a uh, volunteer to help me out. Danny, perfect. That would be great. <laughs> oh, you looked up. I thought that meant you were volunteering. That's great. Come on up. You're my neighbor this morning. All right. So here's, here's your neighborly hat. All right. Excellent. So go, you're in the yellow house. Now, you know that, uh, you stand right there. You can stand up there even. So you know, of course, that in, in the day, early day, this is an early picture of Levittown, you know, almost no fences. And if there were, there's another one here of kind of, look at this, almost no fences. And the ones they have are these tiny little fences, like like these, you know, and so you would, this is, hey, neighbor, how are you? You know, we would talk, like over the fence, we would chit chat, and we would, we would, we would build community, we would get to know each other, and, and it would be, it would be good, in fact, there, there's a picture of these guys who, they're, look at this, you see, look, look where, are the, where are the fences? They got nothing going, this is the way it was first built, right? And then, as the community developed, look at how you'd mow your lawn. Imagine this, Three guys, like we're all just back there, you know, hanging out, shooting the breeze, building a friendship because we're neighborly, right? And this, this is the way so many of us picture it in our heads. But for one reason or another, you know, maybe because, you know, we want to keep the kids safe or the dogs safe or maybe because we don't want, you know, the creepy neighbor kind of looking at us in the backyard while we're sunbathing. We, we put up these fences. So you come on, stand behind this fence here. For me, that'd be great. Now, we need a name for, for our guy. What, what, what should we name him for my neighbor? 
Wilson, that's a good pick. Let's name him Wilson. And so, and so now, here, come on up a little further. Can you, like, this is, this is the, I mean, this is what we're doing now? Like, you know, I'm not sure we thought through it when we built these and all of the things that are like these. You know, this isn't the only example of how we sabotage ourselves. It's just an example of it. I'm not sure we really understood what we were doing. I'm not sure we, we saw we wanted community, and yet what we actually did is we made ourselves and our neighborhoods less approachable. We made it clear that everyone would know that this is now Mikasa. Because what? Mikasa is... Mi no, we did this last week. Is Mikasa is Mikasa. And so we build the fences and we put the little pointy things on them and we keep Wilson at bay. But that's not what our hearts really needed. And yet, that's what took place. There are changing friendship patterns in the U.S. A research project called The State of Friendship in America indicated that most people are not fully satisfied with their friendships. Overall, 75% of Americans are not satisfied in their friendships. Gen X and the baby boomers, you guys suffer even more. Lower levels of overall satisfaction. And yet people who say they have lots of close friends experience more happiness. Why don't we pursue it? Why don't we do whatever it takes? The research also indicated, by the way, who do you think are the people who have higher satisfaction? Those who go to religious services or those who don't? Religious services. Two times more likely to be fully satisfied in their friendships than those who never. Conservatives or liberals? Who are more satisfied in their friendships? Conservatives, more. Urban dwellers or rural, suburban dwellers, more satisfied in their friendships? Urban. See, we work against ourselves, but we actually were pursuing the very thing that we are losing. The research study said that nearly half of those who say that they have seven or more close friends strongly agree with the statement, I feel happy more often than not. Seven or more close friends. Go ahead and start counting up yours. One, two, how many you got? You know, can you get up to, the, up to that seven mark or do you find yourself somewhere short? By contrast, 24% of those with only one close friend say the same thing. And if you have none, it drops to 19%. A great number of people alone. See, suburbia promised us this small town vibe, this connection with others that we crave and it often doesn't deliver on the promises. All right, Wilson, over here, basketball time. You thought I forgot him. No. <laughs> basketball time. All right, so, you know, here we are, a couple of friends, and you know, there was a time when kids would go to the local park, and they would just, there would be a pickup game, right? They would, they would all gather up. They'd have nothing to do. There were no, no iPads and stuff like that, and believe it or not, kids. kids. And, uh, you know, the kids would come out to a, to a little hoop. It would be a town hoop usually, and they would just gather up, right? And they would just be able to hang out and play because, of course, the game has to be played, best played, with other people. And I think that this feeling, this pickup game feeling, the nostalgia of those memories was so powerful. I think it was something that we desired to, that, that we wanted for our kids in such a powerful way because so many people experienced it that we wanted to capture it. We wanted to bottle it. We wanted to recreate it to make sure that our kids could experience. And so how did we do that? We bought hoops and we installed them each in our homes because we wanted that on our turf. We wanted it in Mikasa. But by doing so, we didn't, we didn't realize what, what was really going to happen. All right, now make believe you're playing ball. You don't have to actually play ball. You're all by yourself, so you're sad now because I'm over here. I'm like way out. I'm not even over. I don't even see you. You're just playing. See? Because what are you doing? <laughs> Are you really playing basketball now? You're just doing free throws. I mean, you're just shooting a couple of hoops. There's nothing to the game. There isn't the energy of it. And so there was a time, I was driving through a neighborhood. It was not too long ago, and I remember this so vividly. And I just, for some reason, I always notice this. I, by the way, I confession time. I just bought one of these, another one for my house. Um, so my hypocrisy is well noted. But... <laughs> So, I mean, I literally just did last week. So, uh, anyway, so I was driving through this one neighborhood, and I'm noticing they're on, like, every, you know, every couple of houses, there's one of these, I don't know, 
$1,000 brand new, these beautiful, you know, hoops all over the, and I, I noticed there was only one kid using all of these dozen or more of these things on this street. One kid, look sad, looking sad like this, you know, shooting the occasional hoop. He's like, right, looking all sad. I drove around, I, I went not a block and a half away from that kid's house, turned, uh, made a couple turns, and what do you think I found over there? Another lonely kid shooting hoops by himself. And I was like, what happened here? Like, I wanted to stop and be like, hey, guys, can you, can you just do it together? Can you play? Like, you can do more of the game. Because, of course, basketball is a team sport. And, of course, that's why we love it. It's a team sport. Solitary sports are fine. They have their place. But we often want to be a smaller part of something bigger. We would rather be a team. We'd rather be able to play. We'd rather be able to make plans. We'd rather be able to pass a little bit and dribble and have a, you know, play some defense and play some offense. You see, this is, we would rather do that than be the center of the whole story. Because life is a team sport. Life is a team sport. And we wanted to be part of something that was larger than ourselves, and suburbia didn't deliver on those promises. All right, now we're going to grill. So you're going you're to over at the barbecue. Wilson's going to whip us up something fantastic here. So you grab your utensils here. There you go. You got that one too. You're going to use them both. And you're going to whip us up some, something delectable here. All right? So now you go in to, you know, the, you go into the store, and you're buying, buying the grill, right? And the plan was to buy the grill so that you could throw parties. Because if it wasn't, you would have gotten this grill. You would have gotten the, the tiny, tiny little grill. <laughs> right? So you would have walked in there, you'd been like, listen, you know what? Rather than use my indoor stove for the hot dog I'm going to make tonight, I'm going to get the outdoor stove. Who does that? Who actually goes to the store and says, you know what? I'm going to buy the tiniest little grill I can. If you're anything like us, we went in there and, you know, we... We, we looked at these grills, and I'm like, obviously, we have to buy the biggest one we can afford. I mean, it doesn't, I mean, what else is there to do? We have to obviously, why do I have to obviously buy the biggest grill I can afford? Because it's, it's for all the people that will be entertaining on the grill. All the food you're going to be, whip, come whip, whip it up. Yeah, all the <laughs> hamburgers you're going to be flipping, all the hot dogs. You didn't buy the tiniest little grill because, of course, the very idea of it was to experience something that was far more than simply me cooking a solitary meal for myself. And yet, many, we wanted, we knew what we wanted. We wanted to open up our lives. We wanted to be able to bless other people with it. And how many of us now, we go a whole season, we don't even have to change the propane tank. Right? Some of you are like, I don't think I, you have to change the propane tank? Yes. <laughs> if you use it, you have to change the propane tank. I'm not kidding you. It's like a, it disconnects and everything. And the kinds of examples like this abound, where we, we find ways to pull back. Even though we secretly crave it, we find ways. You know, so, you know, I, when I go to the gym, which is like, like, it was like twice in the last six months. And so when I, when I go to the gym, and you know what happens, right? First off, I don't like the gym. I would rather have a gym in my house. And many of you have made this decision, right? So you buy equipment, instead of going to the gym, you bring the gym to you, mi casa. But now let's say that doesn't work out. And now you just have to go out there and be with the rest of the sweaty people. And so what you do is you go to the gym, but you, you figured out a way to create a barrier, didn't you? What's the barrier? The headphones. The headphones, of course, this is what we do. The barrier so that I can keep all of you people away from me. I'm building my little psychological fences. I kid you not, that both times I went to the gym, I put my headphones on in the car. In the car, while I'm sitting in my car, I put on my headphones, I turn on my music. The lady at the, at the counter, she can't even say hello to me. I walk in already in my bubble, already protected from all of the people, and yet we actually want this. Let's give Wilson a hand here for helping us out. The promises of suburbia they haven't panned out, and yet the human need for real connection is as strong as it has ever been. We wanted friendship. We wanted to be part of something bigger than ourselves. We wanted to create moments with other people, moments of genuine connection. Last week, 
when we were looking at the, the beginning of this series, we highlighted the difference between happiness and the way so many of us pursue the promises of the blessed life, what God promises. And we saw that the only way it's going to happen is if we make God the center of who we are and what we do. That was, the, that was a starting point for our series. But today, I want to challenge each one of us to press deeper into this koinonia that we're going to take a look at. Press deeper into koinonia. Would you open up in a Bible to Philippians chapter 2? We're starting in verse 1. Because you see, genuine koinonia starts with the Holy Spirit and it fuels a life-giving koinonia with others. And it is costly, but it is well worth it. Now this word koinonia, it's a word group used in the New Testament in lots of different places, 20 or so times. And it refers to the connection that we can have with other people, to fellowship, to communion, to sharing of life with others, sharing things in common. That's how the word, it's interpreted a lot, it's translated a lot of different ways. But, uh, so you'll never see the word koinonia, of course, but that's the Greek word behind this idea of Christian fellowship, which is so, so essential to the Christian life. Because believers have to come together. They have to come together in love and encouragement and in faith. And it's only then that we really begin to see what this looks like. In, in uh, Philippians chapter 2, 1 and 2, he says, Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing, that's the idea right there, that's the word, koinonia, any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. There's a unity found in this koinonia. Now you understand it because you've got, you know, you have strangers. Those are the people you don't know. There's the biggest circle of your relationship, strangers, some of whom are strange, right? And then inside that ring, you have your acquaintances. It's a whole lot of people you say hi to at the office and you're going to the grocery store, whatever. These are your acquaintances. And then a smaller relationship circle are your friends. This is your friendship circle. And that's a great circle. You need a lot of friends, fantastic stuff. But inside the friendship circle is a smaller, far more significant one. That's your koinonia circle. That's your koinonia. That's where real fellowship takes place. That's where the real you is known. That's where your real struggles come out and your real joys are shared with others. It's where life gets real, sometimes raw. That's your koinonia. And it's essential that we experience it. Because it means that we're no longer alone. It means we're connected with others. But if you notice what he says, if you have any common sharing, any koinonia in the spirit, then you'll make his joy complete by being like-minded with each other, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. It's as if he's saying that if you want this fence between you and Wilson taken down, the first way, that the first problem is there's a fence between you and the Holy Spirit. He's saying, if you have any koinonia with the Spirit, he's asking, do you have koinonia with the Spirit? Because God is on the other side of this fence and he's simply too much of a gentleman to come break it down and tear it down. You need to do that. We put up the fence between us and God. So where are you at? You still have that fence between you and God? When you hear Christians talk about how they have a personal relationship with God, do you experience that? When they talk about how they hear from Him and experience Him and know that He's involved in their life and how He spoke to them through the Word and how when they were praying, they experienced... Because if you haven't experienced that, then you still got a fence between you and God. We don't say those words. We don't make those things up. That is the real and genuine experience of many Christ followers. And if it isn't yours... You've got a fence that you need to tear down. If you don't have that kind, if you haven't experienced koinonia with God, this is your call as to whether or not you're going to press past, tear it down, and get that connection because you're never going to experience real koinonia with others and certainly not with your spiritual family, with followers in Christ, if you don't first start with, koin with a genuine koinonia with God. That's what he's saying in this passage. We need that one first to experience it with him, and then we can begin to experience it with each other. Have you? Will you? 
It's essential to tear down that fence. And then you get to reorient yourself toward koinonia in every area. You get to admit your need for it. You get to embrace the possibilities of it. You get to start restructuring your entire life to experience it. And it's an amazing, amazing thing to get connected to your spiritual family in this way, to open up your life to them so that they can open up their lives to you. It's a gift. And it's how you can start to experience koinonia. Then you move to the basketball hoop. You know, look in uh, Acts chapter 2. Open up if you would just flip over Acts chapter 2, verse 42. And we're going to talk here about how you now need to engage in koinonia. Acts chapter 2, verse 42. This is the very beginning of the church. This is the picture that they have of who the early Christians were, what they looked, how they lived together. This is, this is an amazing verse to me. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Catch that, the, rig, rig, the rigorous. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the koinonia, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together. They had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes. They ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Basketball is a team sport. Life is a team sport. Koinonia is a team sport. And you need to engage in it. You need to press past the awkwardness of being on the outside. You remember what that was like, right? You were, let's go back to those pickup, pickup days or, you know, the kids are playing on the playground and the game is already happening and you show up with your ball maybe. Court's already taken. Now you're going to stand there like an awkward child, right? Maybe that was you. You were standing on the side like, hi guys, can I play? I brought my ball. There's already a game in, in motion. What are you going to do now? Well, let's start from the perspective of the kids already playing. Let's say you're one of the kids already in, you're already in, you're already having a blast. And you see the new kid come. What do you do? Do you, call, do you, do you bag the game and you mix up the teams again? You say, hey, everyone, hey, everyone, we got some new players here. Let's get them folded into the team. All right, like, you're going to join this team. We're going to mix up these teams, balance them out, make them fun. We're going to start over. We're going to have it fun. We'll pick it up. There we go. Do you fold people in? Do you engage with them so that they can experience koinonia? And let's say you're that awkward kid and no one did. That no one has the care, the respect to stop the game and invite you in. You take your ball and go home. And you say, you know what? Fine. I'll just be alone. You go home and ask your mom and dad to buy you a big hoop, stick it in your driveway, or do you press in no matter what? Do you insist? Do you find the other kids who still need to find a, a pickup game? See, there's all of these decisions all along. Will you engage in koinonia like the first church did, like the early Christians did? Because if you're going to engage in it, it's going to take some risk. You know, we create all these social events at the church for this reason. Take the risk, press into the relationship, start to engage. We have ministry volunteer opportunities. You know, we have this, this booth back here, the table, people, Allison and, and part of her team, they're all, they all are back there to help you get engaged. Why are we trying to help you get engaged? Yes, there's work to be done. There's ministries to have so that you can push in deeper into koinonia so that you can engage with a larger group of people. Because it's a team sport. You know, we have the street fairs yesterday and today. Did you participate? Will you participate? It's one more opportunity you have to engage with the team, to be a part of something bigger than yourself, and to begin to have koinonia as a lifestyle choice. Growth groups, an amazing opportunity. In fact, you can take out your connection card right now. If you're not in a growth group, that connection card is your way. You know, the one you get when you, when you walk in. That card, you're going to fill it out in a little bit, and you're going to write your name, prayer request. That's a way for you to sign up for growth groups. Are you in a group? Have you hosted a group? We're having a hard time finding enough places to even host the groups that we have right now. Though the a number of people that want to get connected, maybe you want to host. Maybe you want to open up your home in that way. 
This is the legitimate, this is a legitimate way to begin to engage. There's only so much that other people can do for you if you are not willing to press in deeper. Engage. Find a way to do it. Growth groups are an amazing way. And then here's a little bit more of an advanced moment for us. For the barbecue, we're going to talk about creating koinonia. Creating koinonia. See, so far you've experienced it and, you, you know, you, you started to experience it here and you're starting to engage with it here. But in a very real way, we're still taking from koinonia. We're still taking the benefits that we want from it. This is, a, this, is a, this is more like uh, more sophisticated stuff for you, but I want to try to explain it very, very quickly for you. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he says, innumerable times a whole Christian community has broken down because it had sprung from a wish dream. This serious question set down for the first time in Christian community is likely to bring with him a very definite idea what Christian life together should be and to try to realize it. But God's grace speedily shatters such dreams. Just as surely as God desires to lead us to a knowledge of genuine Christian fellowship, so surely must we be overwhelmed by a great disillusionment with others, with Christians in general, and if we are fortunate, with ourselves. The sooner this shock of disillusionment comes to an individual and to a community, the better for both. Every human wish dream that is injected into the Christian community is a hindrance to genuine community and must be banished if genuine community is to survive. He who loves his dream of a community more than the Christian community itself becomes a destroyer of the latter, even though his personal intentions be ever so honest and earnest. He becomes a destroyer of the latter. What he's saying here is if you love community, which I understand why you would, the love the experience, you love engaging. It's because you might say to yourself, you know, well, I love it because, I mean, I love having people who will listen to me. I love having people who will help me out when I'm in a jam. I love having people I can spend Friday night with so I'm not alone. I love having, you're starting to get a picture, right? You love the community so much that you're able to take everything you need from it. That's great. That's fine. That's baby steps. You want to move forward in the Christian life. You want to get to the advanced stages of what it means to follow Jesus. You need to create community for others. If you love community for the sake of community, you love an ideal. And the very first time someone disappoints you, lets you down, and doesn't give you what you needed from it, Christian community gets shattered. But that's not true Christian community. You see, true Christ Christian community is rooted in forgiveness. It's rooted in the sacrifices another makes, the ability to create it for others. That's more advanced Christianity. That's where we need to press deeper. This is great for the early days. This is great to get a taste for it and understand. But to create community, to bring people around, to experience the kind of shared life, to create such an experience for them, not simply that you're getting what you want out of it so that many others are getting the thing that their soul most deeply needs, now we're talking about something powerful. Will you do that? Will you be able to do that? You see, it's not about loving community. It's about loving the people in the community. And they're very different things. They seem very close at first, but they're not. And mature Christians know the difference. They experience the difference. And it's a powerful, powerful truth. You can imagine what this, I've got an article about this whole thing, by the way. It's, a, it's really great. It's a PDF. I can't go into all the details of it. But if you want a copy of that article, I will send it to you. Mark your connection card that you want the PDF. And we will send you this article that talks about some of the Bonhoeffer ideas and the, the idea of creating true community for others or living in it. Because when you love people in these ways, koinonia will emerge. It will, it will be birthed. And if you, want to, if you want to create, if you want to be that kind of a person, you'll have to restructure your whole life in order to embrace that reality, to cultivate it, the kind of forgiveness, the focus on other, to build up even your own reserves. You see, originally I told you that koinonia is costly, but it's worth it. It's costly, but it is 
worth it. You got to start, tear, tear down this fence between you and God. Experience koinonia with other people. Press in no matter what it takes. Engage in koinonia with all sorts of other people. Mix it up. Be a friend, sacrificial, all of that kind of stuff. And then figure out what it would mean to go deeper into the Christian experience to create community. Ask yourself, how many times have I had people in my house in the last week, in the last month? I mean, I hope it hasn't been more than a month. I hope it hasn't been that long. What are you doing to create community? Are you throwing the party? Are you getting the grill going? Are you folding people in? Do you have them in your home? Are you loving on them? Are you saying, this is a safe place for you to experience genuine koinonia? And you, imagine what this would be like. Imagine if in... If you were to pursue spiritual health and vitality with such vigor, imagine that you could get to the place in your own life where your input needs are lower than your output capabilities. Imagine what that would be like. Rather than having to keep taking, that you can actually give. There's only one way you're going to do that. You've got to be connected to the source of genuine koinonia. And I hope he's not separated from you by offense. Would you pray with me? Father, we're asking that you would make this ever more real of us, that you would teach us, Lord, what it means, what you would be able to give to us, Father, uh, this kind of experience of koinonia. Teach us, Lord. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. In just a moment,